Coming to you from Northern California. Uh, negative K, nothing further. I just said. This is the Shots Fired Podcast. Back on the town property case, I'll be 76. With your hosts, Sergeant Kyle Schoberg, retired police officer Mark Redlich, and Deputy Billy. We are America's leading law enforcement resource for training and tactics from experts in the industry. Here are your hosts. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Shots Fired podcast. We are here again at the Calfia Conference and Symposium in Irvine, California. Here we have with us Phil Downs that we just snagged from the conference. Phil, you just gave a fantastic presentation. Appreciate it. On A35, the new use of force law in California. Right. And uh, we really appreciate you carving out a little bit of time um, to spend with us on the podcast uh, to further educate our listeners. So thank you for, for stopping in. Um, can you go ahead and tell uh, our listeners a little bit about yourself and what exactly you do? Yeah, yeah. So, well, first, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for inviting me up here. Absolutely. Yeah, to talk. Um, so, all right. So what I do, I'm an attorney. Um, I'm licensed to practice law in California. Um, I've been practicing law since 2015, thereabout. And um, the area, I'll call it like the area of competency because expertise is one of those things that there's like ethical rules about calling yourself an expert as a lawyer. So my area of competence is defending police officers when they've been sued uh, for alleged civil rights violations. And, And that statute is Title 42 USC 1983. That's the the statute that um, those claims arise under, and typically it's federal litigation. Um, but I've been uh, teaching uh, throughout the state since about 2019. I was doing some uh, some post-approved courses for uh, legal update and uh, de-escalation, um, and I've been doing that simultaneous with my uh, practice. And so I work at a law firm in South San Francisco. Uh, it's called Cholakian and Associates. Um, we have a, a 1983 practice group. Um, like currently right now we, we, we handle cases for the Oakland housing authority police department. And, um, my professional goal is to, uh, kind of continue to build my trial experience defending police officers. And, and I'll do that as long as I am, am able to do it. So, um, yeah, so uh, as a lawyer, within this area, it's a niche area. Um, not everyone does it. And, uh, I find it rewarding. My, I came from a law enforcement household. My dad was a police officer in San Francisco for 30 years. Wow. Yeah. You know, and, um, my brother's currently a police officer in San Francisco. Uh, so I'm, I'm predisposed to it, I yeah. think. And, um, it's, it, it's kind of, uh, I guess it's interesting. Like I just, I happened upon it when I was uh, looking for a job out of law school, I'd taken the bar, passed it. And you know, no one will hire a first year attorney because you're too expensive to train because you really, you really don't know, you really don't know anything. Right. (laughs) So you're like, you know, my options were working for free for a DA's office in like a, a temporary role. And, and then like nothing else. But my dad um, ran into one of his old academy classmates who ended up becoming an attorney. And, and that's how I got a job interview. And this guy happened to practice the 1983 case, cases. Hmm. And, and so that's how I happened into it. And then once I started, it was like, it was like no, this is a good fit. Um, I really enjoy the practice area and and these are cases where, because people feel, you know, especially um, kind of the social, uh, the social component of the fact that it's a police officer, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of feeling of like, wait a second, we want to defend our guys and gals when they do right. And so a lot of these cases, even though most of them settle, a lot of them will go to trial. And, 
and I found that I actually like enjoy trial. Really? Weirdly, yeah. It's hmm. the most exciting part of the job. I think most cops hate going to trial. Yeah. Well, the goal the goal is always to try to get the case, you know, get the case kicked out so that it doesn't have to go to trial. Right. And so we can win on a motion to dismiss or a motion for summary judgment. We always make that make that attempt, but if it does have to go to trial, just for me personally, it's like it's like no, this is uh it's what I always thought attorneys were supposed to do. A lot of attorneys don't like going to trial. Really, it kind yeah. of throws them off, but I don't know. It worked for me, and I think it just fit with my background. You know, I came out of the Marine Corps in 2007, trying to look for something to do, and I I floundered around for a little bit and decided to go to law school, and for whatever reason, it it stuck with me. So I don't know if I like awakened my inner nerd uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and found well found that I I actually enjoy some intellectual stuff. Yeah, you know, so I can, you know. In the Marine Corps infantry, some of it's intellectual, I guess you could say, but it's, yeah. not, it's not typical that you would you would find that. And I don't know, it just it, it something clicked for me in practicing the constitutional legal areas, you know, because police officer use of force questions are Fourth Amendment questions, and um, there's just something I really appreciate about our system, yeah, how the framework is laid out. Well. If it's any consolation to you, you come highly recommended. And, and I mean, I've heard your name pop up several times throughout my career. So, um, very popular. So you're doing something well, right. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's good. That's good to know. And, you know, I, um, had met with some guys, um, cause I was defending a number of, um, a number of deputies in Napa County that uh, we had a lot of cases with them and that's not the, that's not a pejorative. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it happened to be that, um, you know, public entities get sued and that's common for police officers because anytime you have an interaction under color of authority with a member of the public, it implicates the constitution and the constitution as we know is written in a way where, um, your rights are defined by limitations on government authority. And so if there's a question as to whether or not you overstepped your authority, then, that usually is the basis for a lawsuit. And obviously there's money involved in it. Right. Civil cases are involving money. Right. Um, and typically not the officer's money. It's about, you know, really the public entity's insurance. Yeah. And yeah. and there's attorneys who make a really decent living suing public entities. Right. So, deep um, pockets. Yeah. They have very deep pockets, yeah. And one of the things actually is interesting too, and, and I don't know if everyone in your audience would know this, but if... Like, let's say, let's say I was on the other side of the table and I was bringing cases against police officers. If I prevail at trial, even if my, even if my client in the, in the final analysis, the money damages are calculated as like a personal injury case, just for all intents and purposes. So think of like a car accident kind of a thing. Like someone was injured after an encounter with an officer, the value of that injury is what predominantly makes up the damage award that would, the jury would, would give in a verdict. So even if I have someone who's not very injured, maybe like $10,000 of worth of an injury, which is something very minor, if I prevail and that verdict is in my client's favor, meaning the officers were found to have used excessive force, I then as an attorney am entitled to file what's called a motion for fee recovery. And so I get paid my fees. Wow. And my fees start running as soon as I touch the case. So oh, wow. one of yeah, so, so you one pay of pay yourself. You do, yeah. You get paid from from the well from the insurance pool right. or, or if the entity is self insured, you know, you, and those fee those fee awards, I'll give you an example. When, during the the talk earlier today, you know, I was relaying the story about uh, a case that um, I helped defend uh, for the city of Los Banos and this is Lamb v. City of Los Banos and it's uh, it ended up after trial, because we lost, there was an appeal taken, and um, you know, so it's a published Ninth Circuit opinion now, and it didn't go the way we wanted it to. But um, the fee award on that case was in excess of two million dollars. Holy wow. shit! Yeah. So that wow. is added on top of the verdict that the jury awarded, which was substantial, because I think the jury, the jury felt a certain way about what had happened. Wow. And so, yeah. So, so then you think like, you know, from a litigation standpoint, 
officers might wonder, it's like, man, why do, why is it that we're settling this stuff? Like I didn't do anything wrong, mm -hmm. you know, like I want someone to fight and it's like, trust me, I love, I love to fight and take things to trial. Um, cause I get paid no matter what. Right. But more so like, yeah, well, let, let's, let's test it in front of a jury. Federal jury has to be unanimous. Mm -hmm. Um, so if there's one holdout who thinks that you did right and then the other seven or so, if it's an eight person jury, they think you did wrong. It's a mistrial mm -hmm. and it starts over. And, and so it's like, no, let's, I'm all for trial. The problem is, is that if that guy gets awarded $1, his attorney's coming in with a motion for fees. Wow. And, I didn't know yeah, that. And so I risk, didn't know that so either. So risk managers, county and municipal risk managers are super shy about trial because they're like, is there a, is there an amount that we can pay in settlement to avoid a seven figure, what would be a seven figure verdict, no matter what, yeah. because of the, the way that the fees are, are calculated, you know? Wow. And yeah. Hmm. So, what, so what you're saying is in, in general, if a de police department is sued, they go to trial, they lose that attorney gets the rights of that. The, or the, uh, that attorney gets to submit their time. Wow. And so that's at, why at their rate. And that's why a lot of cities, sometimes settle. Yeah. So even though the Makes officers sense. are like, Hey, this is, you know, fight. Why don't you fight? Yeah. Right. There is that risk. So there, there's total risk. They're playing the risk and it's yeah. like, Hey, you know, we're just going to end it now. Yeah. Financially, it's a smart yeah. decision. Way more smart yeah. to do that. No, it's way. totally, it's a, it's a risk management decision. You know, that wow. that's like never relayed to cops. Like I've never no been told that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know how many cops out there know that, but like well, that's never been now. really that's yeah. good to yeah. know. Yeah. I think that's a way, honestly, by you just saying that, I think for those that are listening, have a better understanding yeah. of, hey, they settled on this, even though I was not in the wrong. Mm -hmm that the city knows that, but they're doing it as a risk factor. Yeah. And settlements are never an admission of liability. Right. Settle, settlements are saying we can test liability, but we're, we're negotiating an alternative to a trial verdict. And the reason for that is mm. predominantly it's like, you know, so, so it's like, or a risk manager will come and ask me, um, or, or, you know, whoever the attorney is defending them. And they would say well, 10 times out of 10, what do you think the outcome is at trial? If you tried this 10 times, what do you think the outcome is? And, and you'd say with a really strong case, six out of 10 times, we probably defense it. But juries are, you don't get to pick who's on the jury, right? You only get to eliminate, like- You get to weed them out. To, and, and yeah, you have to do your, you have to do your damnedest to weed them out. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, you know, picking a jury, for example, in the Northern District of California, San Francisco division, um, we had a trial or I defended two BART police officers and it, the fourth amendment question, we actually got summary judgment. Um, we got summary judgment in our favor on qualified immunity grounds. The case proceeded on a first amendment question hmm. as to whether the officer's detention of the plaintiff was retaliatory in, in response to his speech. And so, so it was, a, it was a, in, it, first amendment cases aren't, common. I would expect they would be more common though, or become more common because, um, well, I don't want to say too much and reveal the secrets, but hmm. making I, a, making a first amendment claim is, I know is, what you're, yeah, yeah I, I get not, what you're saying where, hard where we would get starts yeah. to see those. Yeah. yeah. Protests the, um, or whatever. So we had, you know, so we go to pick the jury and the prospective jurors are all brought in the court and then they get called, you know, random number. They get in, they get in the box for all intents and purposes called the box. And then you, you get to do your voir dire. You get to ask them questions mm -hmm. and um, then you start to get the responses and you've got to try to figure out like, right, where, where are you temperamentally? Um, are you going to be good for my jury? You're going to be, do I not want you? And we're at, we're asking the jurors some questions and this gal in the audience part of the court, she hadn't been yet pulled on to the, to the jury um, as, as far as the prospective panel, but she was, she was in the, in the pool. So mm -hmm. it could have been that she would have gotten picked at some point. And she raised her hand while this other person was talking. And I look over at her and I'm not trying to prejudge anybody, but she had, you know, multicolored hair and lots of facial piercings. And I was just like, judging by the sour look on her face, I've kind of anticipated what she might be saying. And so, <laughs> yeah. so I was like, well, I don't have to, I don't have to, right? 
call on her. She's not in the panel, but I was like, ah, I'll do it because whatever she's going to say is going to be Mm anti-cop. And then I want to ask all these jurors who might be on my panel, do, do any of you agree with her? Right. I want to be able to ask that. Right. Because then they say, I do agree with her. Now I've got my, now I know who I want to challenge and who I want to eliminate. Um, so she raises her hand and she says, you know, I just think I totally disagree with what that person was saying. I think that the police enjoy this power imbalance and, and she went into things about the patriarchy and privilege and, and, and that, uh, the police are always oppressive. Police always lie. And she had a couple other comments and I said, I really appreciate that you would share that with everyone. You know, thank you. And I looked at the jury and I said, do any of you agree? with what she said, no one put their hand up. So I turned and looked at her and I was like, no one agrees with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> and she got, she got really mad. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't end up making it on the panel, but it was important to do that, you know? So, because you end up with, you end up with, with folks who you don't, you've never met them before. This is, this is the beauty of our system though, right? It's for as many flaws and as, as unpredictable as it is, it's a really great system. And, but you don't know these people. Yeah. And it's really interesting to see, you know, after a verdict and I'm, and I've been part of trials that I've won more, I've been part of teams that we've won more trials than we've lost. And whether it's win or lose, you always talk to the jury after and you just get feedback from them and jurors will pick up on the oddest things. Right. And you, I remember this one juror telling me the piece of evidence that really convinced the group I was like, man, I didn't even think that was like the most important piece hmm. of evidence that we had. I didn't think it was the strongest argument that we had, but they, they, they locked onto it and they were like, that's what tilted the difference. So suffice to say, it's, it's a super unpredictable game that you're playing. And when there's the specter of a seven figure attorney fee award looming in overhead, right? Yeah. Risk managers are like how, you know, how many times do you think you defense this? It's like, well, I, I would never guarantee that 10 times out of 10, I would win. The best I'd say on a strong case is six, Oof, you know? So there's a 40% chance yeah, that, the risk in yeah, itself. Yeah. And so then, so then it's like, right, do we want to, you know, it comes down to money, right? Which is, it's not nothing, you know, you know, $2 million in attorney's fees is like, that's a, yeah, that's it's a, a big, lot of that's money. a big check. There's a lot of pain involved in that, right? Yeah, in that check. Yeah. So, so that's why cases will get settled. You know, it's not because, people don't think that the officer did right. It's that, you know, it's like, this is just easier to do it this way. It's business. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it is it's a business, a business it's transaction a business decision. Yeah. 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 Cases will typically go to trial though. If, if the guy or gal who's suing just wants a ridiculous amount of money. Right. Then you're like, fine, we're not going to agree. Right. You know, um, we're not paying you $10 million. Yeah. You know, that's crazy. We're, we're going to go to trial. It so. is kind of wild. I mean, yeah. I, I just think that this, this conversation on that is really the basis of why we do this podcast <laughs> yeah. Yeah. to let people know yeah. what yeah. really happens. <laughs> and there's been such yeah. a misconception and, and, and nobody really knows the answer. Right. And it's yeah. just, and now we have it. And I think that's awesome. Well, and what I tell, what I tell guys, you know, is, is that, and I've only had to tell this to one officer thus far in my career. And I, I imagine that if I continued to have the opportunity to go to trial, you know, I, I can't predict the outcome. So I might have a future losses ahead of me, but I told this one officer, I said, you didn't do anything wrong. This particular jury impaneled at this particular time, based on the evidence that we were able to get admitted, mm. came to a conclusion that you used excessive force. That does not mean, you know, from like a, think of it like from a personal moral standpoint, yeah. right? Um, but, but I think every lawsuit is like, there's lessons to be learned and that's kind of what prompted me to get involved in teaching and traveling around is, you know, I kept seeing the same, well, like the stuff I was talking about today, that's derived from my trial practice. Mm -hmm. Right. And I kept seeing these patterns emerge, uh, with officers where, where I'm like, what, what is being missed in law enforcement? in California yeah. that I keep seeing the same thing again and again. And I'll give you an example. Like, so okay, at the end of, of the, the presentation I was given today, I talked about report writing mm-hmm. and the importance of using 
actual, you know, good English language, you know, writing, like be descriptive right. to, to get across granular detail in an objective way, mm-hmm. right? We're not making suppositions. We're not relying on speculation or conjecture. We're not trying to gild the lily, so to speak, by making something sound worse than it was. But right. just, you know, the words that we've fallen into as, as law enforcement community, I'll just give like the example of, you know, um, I guided the suspect to the ground, mm-hmm. right? It's a horrible phrase. It's a horrible phrase. It's actually, it's, there's an argument that it's factually inaccurate because what do you, what, what do you, what do you do when you guide someone? Yeah. Right. I think of a museum. Yeah. And that was the joke that I cracked. It was like, like, hello, I'm the, I'm the docent yeah. at the museum of the ground. Yeah. Are you looking for a certain exhibit? Can I guide you there? Yeah. Right? <laughs> and you know, it's like you, you would never use that language to describe, um, what it is you actually did, except for the fact that weirdly these things get entrenched as sort of customs in law enforcement. And so I would see, you know, when a case would come to our office and my boss would get it and he'd say, this one's yours, you know, start running with it. And I, the first thing I do is I look at the report and I'm reading the report and the, at best what I have are elements of a crime that was committed. Mm-hmm. The reports always speak to the elements of a crime. And for good reason, because if they don't speak to the elements of a crime, then you're not going to get that person held to answer after prelim, right? So officers write to the, to the criminal elements really well, the statutory elements, whatever the penal code section is, it was violated or believed to have been violated. But then when it comes to describing force, it's like the most I was getting from these reports was that the suspect resisted or sometimes the suspect actively resisted the suspect did a lot of things like pull, manage. Uh, the officers did things like guide and assist or deliver distraction strikes. Um, and, and there was no, I, if I were looking at it like a movie script, mm-hmm. I wouldn't know how to play the part of the suspect. That's a good way of putting it. So wow. then, so then I'd go to the, I'd go to the body camera video and, and, and look, you know, if it were up to me, I would have, I'd have a, a chest camera and I'd have like a GoPro that would sit above my head <laughs> with a fisheye lens, yeah. right? So I could capture everything because I think video is great because a video is an independent witness with no bias, mm-hmm. right? And so you can tell a jury, if you don't believe my officers, go to the video. If you're not sure who to believe, go to the video because the video is a disinterested witness. It just sees what it sees mm-hmm. and it hears what it hears. And that's objective, right? So I would then look at the video and sometimes in a 2D format, depending on, well, first of all, if anything goes to the ground, the video is worthless because it's, it's not showing me anything. Yeah, it's like, it's, 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 it's terrible. Yeah, it's the officer's chest on the suspect's back. Mm-hmm. So it's a black screen and all you do is you can hear shuffling and, and, and grunting and that kind of stuff. It's really hard to piece it together. You'd have to get different angles, cover officers arriving. If there's surveillance footage, that kind of stuff to piece it together. So, and then even if you pieced it together from, let's say surveillance footage, like Nahod V. Browder is a really good example. So it's a 2019 case out of uh, San Diego. It was a call of a 417 man with a knife who brandished it at a uh, bookstore employee downtown and then was seen leaving through an alleyway. And so the officer who arrived on scene um, is, is, is driving into the, is driving into the, into the alleyway. And that's when he gets a visual on the suspect, confirms the guy's description. And then, you know, what results is a fatal shooting. And the officer's version of events was the guy kind of like, to use the term, this is another jargon term that I think it needs to go away you know, the suspect was ag- aggressed towards the vehicle, right? The, su- the suspect's demeanor was aggressive and the officer believed he saw a, an object resembling a knife in, in the suspect's hand. But there's no body camera video of it because the officer didn't activate his body camera. The only video of this incident is like the fly on the wall, you know, perspective from behind the, the, the shooting, um, on the alleyway. Like a surveillance camera? Surveillance camera, yeah. yeah. And so when you look at the surveillance camera, you're like, 
but that doesn't show me anything. It just shows me this guy walking, looking like he's drunk. Ooh. And then, and then you get out of your car and you shoot him. And so that's a, that's a dispute for a jury to resolve. Yeah. Right. So, so you, <clears throat> when you look at like, you know, the importance of a good report or the importance of a good statement, you have to assume when you're writing your report or you're giving your statement, if it happens to be, God forbid, a shooting, you have to assume that your statement or report is going to stand alone as the, as the historical record of what happened. You can't rely on, well, my body camera would have captured it or there's surveillance footage in the area. You have to assume that none of that is going to show what it was that you saw. And when you work from that assumption, then it, it, work from that assumption and then if you're not good with words that's okay you just need to practice getting better at words so you need to read literature hmm. start with an easy book like grapes of wrath it's an easy read john steinbeck writes in a way that's accessible to a wide audience and it's he's an american author so if you're if you like american literature pick hmm. grapes of wrath and you can read grapes of wrath and then all of a sudden you're going to come away with that finding new ways of describing what it is that you observe in, in your surroundings. And like, um, you know, when I give an expanded report writing class, I'll read from grapes of wrath and the excerpt that I'll read is the end when, um, uh, Ma, the character Ma, she's kind of the matriarch of the family. Um, you know, the context of this is the Okies escaping the dust bowl during the depression and going into California looking for, labor and it's it's just brutal farm work and there's not a lot of it so there's just it's just a story of privation and suffering and but also redemption it's like the redemption of the human spirit and there's at the end scene uh rosa sharon who's ma's daughter is <coughs> nurses uh nurses a dying man from her breasts right but the the way that steinbeck lays that out and the way he describes rosa sharon and ma having this unspoken conversation it's, it's powerful in a way and it's, it's imagistic in a way where you know exactly what it is that's happening. And it's, and it's not, it takes like three sentences for him to get the point across. And it's like, if you could just grab like a 10th of that mm -hmm. descriptive power hmm. to describe what it is like a suspect's countenance, like what is their demeanor, right? What was it like to encounter this person? And you can get that across to your reader. Your body camera doesn't pick that up, no. right? Yeah. It doesn't, it's not going to pick up your, what you can objectively describe yeah. and use to support your feelings. So, so I think from like that standpoint, that's what we're talking a lot about, you know, report writing, um, as an, as the tie in to, it's one thing to go through, like today we went through, uh, you know, the fourth amendment framework under Graham v. Connor and the jury instructions 9.25. Mm -hmm. Um, and we covered 835A. It's one thing just to say, here's the frameworks. But then it's like, you've got to write to these frameworks. Okay. And so, and I can, I can start with, with either one, if you'd like, if you want to yeah. break them down. Okay. So, so the fourth amendment framework, let's just begin there. One of the things, and this is a myth that I dispelled early on in the, in the talk is that Graham V. Connor stands for the proposition that officers may only use objectively reasonable force. Okay. Um, that's because the hallmark of the fourth amendment is reasonableness. That's that entire amendment is based upon that, yeah. that principle. The question that was presented to the Supreme court in Graham occurred in the context of there were, there were different circuit courts of appeal throughout the country that were applying a mishmash of standards to the question of whether the officer's use of force was excessive. So you had some circuits were applying some kind of a hybrid like eighth amendment standard about in the eighth amendment turns on subjective intent, right? That's a cruel and unusual punishment standard. So like, um, that's your, if you're imprisoned, um, that's your protection against being cruelly or, or unusually punished. It also limits the government's authority to make certain things illegal. The eighth amendment is what that Boise court relied upon with regards to that homeless decision. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So that's an eighth amendment decision. Mm -hmm. So wrap your brain around that for a second. Anyway. <laughs> so, so that some, some circuits were doing that other circuits were trying, trying to solve this from a due process standpoint, a 14th amendment standard. 
in the Supreme Court came in and just answered the question. It's like, no, when a police officer seizes an individual by force, it's a Fourth Amendment question. The Fourth Amendment standard is objective reasonableness. Here's the test. Here's the analysis. And a test is a framework. So the Supreme Court said the whether an officer's use of force uh, is objectively reasonable requires the careful weighing and balancing of the competing interests at stake. And in any interaction under color of authority with the government, the interests that compete on the one hand are the individual liberty interests in, that are protected by the Fourth Amendment. And then the other is the government's interest in, in doing whatever it is that it's, it's supposed to do, like affect an arrest, for example. So the court said you have to carefully weigh and balance the competing interests. And on the one hand, the Fourth Amendment is described as, the Fourth Amendment interest is described as something called the gravity of the intrusion. So it's interesting, the court is taking um, force and using the type and amount or the nature and quality of the force to establish the contours of the interest that's protected by the Fourth Amendment, right? So that's why they call it the gravity of the intrusion. And, you know, how much force was actually used? Well, that's going to be, that's going to be significant and it's relevant because if there's a, a lot of force that's used, then it's a, that's a, a lot of exercise of government authority. So there better be some sort of other competing interest on the government interest side to justify that. So that's why the scales are balanced. And this is the image that I use because it is a balancing test. I just say to officers, when you think about Graham, think about scales. On the one hand is the gravity of the intrusion. That's the force that you used, right? right? That has a certain weight to it, mm -hmm. okay? And then if you get into the jury instructions, Ninth Circuit model jury instruction 9.25 is the, is the uh, categorical framework of, of how this test operates, right? Because that's what the jury's gonna be handed when they go to deliberate and they take all the evidence and they kind of fit it into these categories and then they do the, the balancing, they do the weighing. The government interest side is the other side of the scale. And that, that scale, what matters most to put on that scale is to describe the, whether the threat was immediate and significant at the time that force was used. That is the most important factor. Yeah. And that, that principle is reiterated throughout, um, you know, in every Ninth Circuit opinion that I've ever read, having to do with excessive force that's the principle that they remind everyone. The most important factor is whether the suspect pose an immediate threat, an immediate and significant threat. And then you say, okay, so like, what does that mean for us? Well, it means that, it means that your force may not, your force may not exceed the immediacy and severity of the threat that is posed. It's like a general rule. Right. If you have a very immediate, like, high, and I, immediacy is relative. I say immediacy because you can have a situation where there starts off at a high threat level, mm -hmm. then the suspect gives himself up. Right. There's not no threat, but there's less threat than there was post maybe two seconds beforehand. Yeah. Right. Or the opposite is true, and this is what happened to my to my brother in San Francisco. Is he goes to approach him, uh, a male suspect who's wanted for, uh, or the report was uh, causing a disturbance. So something relatively minor. And as my brother uh, was walking toward this individual, um, he drew a uh, handgun from his, he drew a revolver from his um, hoodie pocket and fired off three shots. And the, one of those three struck my brother in the top of the head. Oh, wow. And huh. my brother did not know that this guy had even shot him. That's how fast it happened. Wow. until he hit the ground and kind of came to realizing that, you know, he had been shot, uh, still having the wherewithal to activate his body worn camera right? wow. after, he, after he checked himself for, for if he was hit anywhere else. Probably because um, you, uh, reiterated that to him. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I, camera I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hard on him. Yeah. Um, for good reason. Yeah, though. for good reasons. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Well, you got it. You got to have that kind of approach from this as a, it's a profession, right? So, yeah. If, if you're not a dedicated student of federal case authority, then, then that's like not going to the range to practice proficiency with your firearm. Mm -hmm. It's like, 
almost I would ask myself this, why would I want the firearm if I don't understand the rules of when this firearm can come out and I can use it, Yeah. right? So anyway, mm. so that yeah. was no threat situation to the highest possible threat situation mm. in less than a blink of an eye, such that he didn't even know that it had happened. So what police officers are asked to do is, ex- is extraordinarily difficult. It's extraordinarily dangerous in the, the, the analytical framework of the law that is implicated when there's a question of reasonableness. Officers have to speak to that framework. We have to write to it. We have to think to it. We have to say words to it um, in order to justify our actions. And if you don't, then well, you just you just leave yourself. You know, think of it this way. And this is the point I brought up in the in the presentation today. You know, the statute of limitations for let's say you arrest someone and you use force to complete the arrest. And let's say it's just, it's not even like a particularly memorable use of force. Um, let's say you use a leg sweep, right? And that's it. Well, a leg sweep is a constitutionally cognizable conduct. I mean, it's, that's an action that would implicate the Fourth Amendment. And so it would, it would implicate the analytical framework of Graham. And so if there's ever a question, if you're ever challenged on whether that was objectively reasonable under the totality of those circumstances, that would be a, a federal question. You would litigate it. Right. So you do this leg sweep. Uh, you, you end up, you know, adding a 148, right, to to whatever it is also that was the purpose of the arrest. We all know DAs don't prosecute 148s, okay? So let's say that the whole thing is dismissed in the interest of justice or there's a, um, let's say the suspect's in custody for, you know, a couple months and then, and then credit for time served, no contest plea to whatever else the issue was. And then, and then they're back out. The statute of limitations, which is the time frame within which that suspect has to bring his federal civil rights claim is two years because it, it, it follows whatever the state personal injury statute of limitations is in California. That's two years. But while he's in custody detained, while there's a dependency of a criminal proceeding, even if he's not detained, he's out on, on bail, that statute is paused. Mm. So let's say this whole process criminally takes a year to resolve, right? He's got two years from that year oh. to file his claim. Okay. I ask officers this, what is your memory going to be like three years from that moment. Oh, wow. Pretty, yeah. right. pretty garbage. On a minor, on a minor, force, on a yeah. minor resisting that you, you use the leg sweep, right? Yeah. And it, it's, it's going to be, not only is it going to be fuzzy, you might not even have immediately been told, Hey, you've been sued. Like you might not even remember it. Right. Yeah. So what are you going to go to? Your report. Your report. And if your report looks like a piece of shit <laughs> and it <Yeah>. says, <laughs> I guided the suspect to the ground and you give no description at all as to the suspect's demeanor, their countenance, their actions. You don't provide any granular articulated detail to what the suspect's conduct was. Well, then the scales of Graham, if you want to call them that, they're, they're pretty full on his side. Right. And they're, they're pretty freaking empty on yours. Yeah, no doubt. Then, then, all right, so I'm not going to let you go into litigation with your scale, your side of the scale looking all garbage like that. We've got to get the facts out. So, you're going to get deposed in, in the litigation, which yeah. is sworn testimony under oath. It's not in a court, but it's sworn. And the other attorney gets to cross-examine you. If you start adding facts, which if your report sucks, you're going to start adding facts. You have to. You have to, because you've got to color the pictures yeah. to like what happened. Yeah. If you start adding that for the first time in deposition, well, now your credibility is completely shot. Because the, que- the follow-up question is always the same. I, okay, so what you just described was this, 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 and this. Do I have that correct? Yes. Where in your report do yeah. I read that? Oh, I didn't write it in my report. Well, that seems that seems hard to fathom that you wouldn't write something like that in your report. Isn't that significant? Yes. So, but you didn't include it in your report, right? Okay. What are you trained to include in your reports? Things that are significant, things right. that are legally relevant, right? Oh man. So, so now automatically your credibility is shot. And this is another thing about litigation is that 
jurors are instructed. It's not just 9.25 that goes to the jury. There's, I mean, on a case uh, involving use of force, you can have, you can have upwards of like 50 different jury instructions, right? Because depending on what are the issues. Yeah. But there's a lot of instructions. There's an instruction for everything. And one of those instructions that's given is a, a California jury instruction, which has to do with witness credibility. So the jury is instructed that it has the power to disregard all or part of a witness's testimony if they believe that any part of that testimony is less than credible. Wow. Oh man. So that whole deposition could be taken out. So the whole, they don't have to, they don't even have to yeah. think about it. So the jury can completely disregard your version of events yeah. and just go based off if of they're the like, report. I don't report, think, yeah. I think, wow. if, so the jury, the jurors all get there and eight of them unanimously agree that, you know, it just seems like if that actually happened, the officer would have written it in his report right? and he didn't. So therefore he's either incompetent. So that leads me to question his credibility or he's making it up, which leads me to question his credibility. I'm not sure I can, I can accept anything that he said as true, man. And so, and they're perfectly within their, within their powers as instructed to do that. So that's the importance of report writing, like wow. from a, from a, from the standpoint of help your future self out, right? <laughs> yeah. possibly two, maybe three, four years down the line. Okay you're not going to remember what happened. I defended two Antioch police officers, um, on a, on a use of force case that it didn't, they didn't even have a report. The gal was trespassing into Kaiser. So she, she wants opiates, right? She had an untreated collarbone fracture from like three months ago. And I suspected that was DV related. She says it was a car accident, but it wasn't. So, um, so yeah, she's at this Kaiser. Kaiser already has her on the list of don't give meds to this gal because she's oh. done this a whole bunch, yeah. right? So she's refusing to get out of the bed. She's in the ER and they called, they called police. My two guys show up and, and they, they talk with her for like 20 minutes. Now, no body camera. And this happened so long afterwards that there's no point in even trying to go get the surveillance footage because it's like, doesn't that's exist. gone. It's yeah. been overwritten. Yeah. So, so they talk with her for 20 minutes and they offer her a ride home. They offer her, they're not even talking about taking her to jail. We can take you home. Do you have a family member we can call for you to come pick you up? Are you here with anyone who can help you? And she's just denying it left, right and center, yeah. you know? So they're like, okay, there's one of two ways it's going to work. You're either going to leave voluntarily or we have to like haul you out. She's all leave voluntarily. She puts all her stuff together. As they're walking down the hallway with her in front of nurses, doctors, medical staff, none of whom we have names for any of these people because no witnesses were interviewed afterwards, right? She, she takes a swing at, at one of the officers. Well, that officer immediately puts her up against the wall, puts her in handcuffs. Well, she had this untreated collarbone fracture. Yeah. So now she's like, in serious pain and they drag her out when they get to the parking lot her sister's there and they're like you did have family here and she, you know she's not as we would say in police parlance she's non-cooperative right, right. Yeah. she's 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 causing a fuss they say look you're having a bad night they're not going to give you meds doctor says you're fine why don't you just go home mm. right we're not even going to arrest you for the for the uh for taking the swing right whatever penal code section that would be um, they just let her go. There's no report. There's a cat entry describing we arrived on scene, talked to the suspect, escorting her from the hospital. She took a swing at one of the officers. Mm -hmm. We released her to a family member. Like that was like two, two sentences. Mm -hmm. So two years after this happens, she sues within the statute of limitations. So it's timely filed. I get the report. I call these guys after I read the, the cat, cat notes. The cat, the cat. <laughs> yeah, there is no report. Right, yeah. So like I've got, I've got this sentence here looking for the rest of it i call the guys and just say hey to introduce myself you know and what we're doing you got you got sued and here's what we're gonna do and i was like hey do you got a you got a report written on this and they're like i don't honestly don't even know what you're talking about it's uh -oh. like, do you not remember what happened no we know we don't remember what happened right because it's, well, it's not very memorable 
yeah. you know, and all that time is elapsed and all the other calls for service to get involved in that. Mm-hmm. So that was one of those things that like, I would see instances like that, or I would see instances where we would have a report and it would be full of police jargon. You know, I guided the suspect to the ground. I assisted the suspect to the ground. You know, the suspect attempted to get up and began to take several steps away from me or something where it's like, I'm not even clear as to what exactly it is that happened. Yeah. And, and then just, that was so much of an established pattern that I just started asking questions of my clients as to like, you guys write this way? Is this, is this what's, they're like, yeah, that's the way we, we write it. And I was like, no, I got to get out and yeah. Well, like, I think try to try to change perspectives on a lot of this stuff. Yeah, I think the problem is, is our cops are afraid to write exactly what happened, right? They're afraid to say that they punched someone in the face. They're afraid to say right. that they did a leg sweep takedown, right? Because they think that it sounds bad in yeah. the end game. Yeah. Um, but the reality is, is by being scared to write what actually happened by your own words, you're only damaging yourself even worse yeah. to, as if you just put what you did and oh, yeah. then document, like, like you said, like the demeanor of the, of the suspect, right? Mm-hmm. Um, man, that was, that's yeah. huge. Well, like you want to, yeah, and you want to write to the most important element you want to write to is the element of the threat. You need to articulate the, how the threat was immediate and how is it significant? And if, and if you, and if you can do that, if you can hit that wicket, then, then all right, you're going to write a good report because you're going to include all the legally relevant facts mm-hmm. that are objectively articulated. Um, and that report has some, has some power. It's going to help you out two years down the line, three years down the line when you're getting deposed. It's going to help the defense of your case and it's going to justify your actions, right? A poor report doesn't do any justification for anything. And yeah, you know, I, th- I think you're right because that, that is the response I get from a lot of officers of like, well, if I wrote it this way, my sergeant would just send it back to me and tell me to, to rewrite it. Yeah. And I'd say, well, you need, you need to speak up for yourself. You need to challenge your sergeant. And one of the ways that I would challenge it politely is to say, what would you have me say on the stand if an attorney asked me in cross-examination, did you punch my client? What, are you going to perjure yourself? Yeah. You say, no, I delivered a distraction strike. Well, then fine, you want to get cheeky. Okay. That attorney will, will walk you through the distraction strike. And they'll say, did you close your fist before you, you, you close, and they'll ask in the leading one, you closed your fist before you delivered this so-called distraction strike, didn't you? Yes, I did. And you, you retracted your arm back behind your body to, to deliver this so-called distraction strike, didn't you? Yes. And then your closed fist remained closed when it made contact with my client's face. Is that right? Yes. So that's not a punch, right? They'll just point out the stupidity of it right, right yeah. down there. Make you look stupid. Yeah. Or like the example I brought up to the, to the, to the group today, you know, actual testimony, actual cross-examination in trial, you know, my officer had written in his report that he had assisted the suspect to the ground. And I had seen this enough times by that point in my, in my career, I think I was about four years into practicing. I'd seen that enough times where I was like, all right, we're going to be prepared for this because this guy's going to, he's going to jump all over you here. So just be ready for it. And if he gives you this window, if he asks you an open-ended question, you got to save yourself. Right. And so the attorney asked the question, you know, you wrote in your report, this is at trial in front of the jury. You wrote in your report that you assisted my client to the ground. You wrote that, correct? Yes. Did my client ask you for help first? <laughs> and it was like, you know, no, no, he didn't. Yeah. He's like, well, that's not even what you did, right? You tackled my client. Isn't that true? And he says, yeah, I tackled your client. He's not going to lie on the stand. Right. Right. So then if we're afraid to write it a certain way, I would say, Write it in the way that you would admit to if under oath, under threat of penalty of perjury. Yeah. You know, that's a great tip. Yeah. 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 And and just, everything and you just, talked about. And just, yeah. Yeah. and just write and just write it that way. Yeah. yeah. Cause if you're, cause if you're confronted with it under, under cross examination, what are you going to say? Are you going to deny what you did? Will you be lying? Yeah. You're certainly not going to do that. You're not going to commit perjury. No. Right. So, so then you have to admit it. It's like guided to the ground. You swept his legs out from under him, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yeah. Well, then just just freaking write that. Yeah. Just it's what it is. And then explain it, like yeah. why you did that. Exactly. And so I call it the this then that narrative, which is which is to say, you know, the suspect did this and you and you lay out, you know, so the this is is a shorthand 
insert relevant legal facts that speak to the immediacy and significance of the threat. It's really, you're in a right to the 9.25 factors. The suspect did this. So I responded with, and then that is what you did. And you just put it in plain terms. And then what happened? So one of the, one of the, um, one of the jargons that I think we should all dispense with is the whole, I deployed my taser and it did not have the desired effect. Right. Yeah. I've seen that. Yeah. You've seen that. You guys probably seen a lot of that, Mm -hmm. maybe even written it. I know that that gets written almost universally in California. Every report I've ever seen involving someone shooting another person with a taser, it's always a deployment. I have a lot of problems with that phrase because it's like, and I tease it where it's, where it's like, you know, you sound like you're wearing a lab coat, you know, it's like, oh, I'm looking for the desired effect and it didn't happen. And you know, it deployed my taser and it's like, you know, did taser deployed, did the taser deployed, the taser deployed, sir. Yes. You know, did it have the desired effect? No, it did not. It's like, wait, what are you getting across to who are you writing that for? Right. Are you writing that for the taser salesman? You know, yeah. so that he, so that he feels like, you know, he did a good job promoting and marketing his product. No, you need to write that for the jury. And so I just say, just say what it is. And this was controversial when I brought this up, every class I've ever brought this up in teaching, I always get at least one person who reacts when they're like, God, no one would let me write it that way. There's no way my Sergeant would let me write it. And I always say like, well, have your Sergeant call me if you want, but, um, you got to write it in what it is, which is you shot the suspect with your taser and then, and then you describe what happened. So not having the desired effect means it didn't work, Mm -hmm. right? Well, why didn't it work? He dropped on the ground, rolled around until the leads were torn from his chest. That's a really descriptive sentence, right? Yeah. And it also, what does it imply? It shows his dedication to continue fighting you, Mm -hmm. right? It shows the severity and immediacy of the threat. This person's willing to take a taser, taser dart to his body drop on the ground and roll until the thing rips from other people will rip it from their, from yeah. their flesh. Oh, yeah, I've just, seen that. Yeah, yeah. You guys have seen that. So oh, it's like, yeah. so I just say, look, what's, what's more, what is more factually accurate and what's more legally relevant to say I deployed my taser and it did not have the desired effect or to say I shot the suspect in the chest with my taser. He tore the leads from his own flesh and continued forward with his assault. Sounds way better the second way. Sounds way it's, better the it's second just way. The and it's true. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's the same amount of words and it's factually true yeah. as to what happened. Right. Yeah. If that's, if that's picture. what happened, then that's what happened. And that's what you should say. And it paints yeah. a clear picture. Right. And it also paints a clear picture using the legally relevant words, like the legally relevant fact categories, you know, 9.25 Graham v. Connor. And, and then think of it from an 835A standpoint, which we can get into right now, if you guys want, um, you know, it's not, no one in there is concerned about deployment and desired effects. There, that doesn't, that doesn't communicate to the threat. Right. And that's what you got to communicate to. So, um, that's why distraction strikes is such a, such a weird term. It's like, no, just you punched him. Okay. But you had a reason for it, right? Well, hopefully you, hopefully you had a reason for it. Otherwise, yeah. You might've exceeded the gravitational pull of the fourth amendment. Now you're in due process land. You're doing things without any legitimate government justification. Right. So that's dangerous. Yeah. So don't just want, don't just wantonly punch people in the face. Right. If you're going to explain it, explain it. What was the threat? How is it significant? How is it immediate? And how did that lead you to do what you did? And then describe what it is that you did. And then what did the other guy do? So, yeah. you know, it's like, Imagine, imagine that you, you're, you're not telling a fellow officer what happened. You're just telling a civilian what happened, right? They're not going to know your jargon. So you want to capture that audience member and you want them to follow through each part of the story with you. And the impression you want to leave on them is the impression that the event made on you personally, which is not insignificant. I think even though officers are encounter violent individuals regularly. So sometimes it's like, yeah, okay, we got to do another dust up and you know, luckily no one got seriously hurt. So it's like almost a matter of is this, this just becomes routine. You're anesthetized to it or, or it's like, um, you know, it's like, well, that wasn't that significant. It's like, no, 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 no. What objectively happened here? Yeah. Another human being defied the authority of the state. 
yeah. and was willing to, to bring and did bring personal violence against you. That's a serious thing. So let's use serious words to describe it. Right. That let's not, sense. let's not discount ourselves. Yeah. Right. So I, I'm yeah. just blown away at this little amount of time that we've spent with you, the amount of information that you've provided that <laughs> is not only going to save officers. I mean, you, you do a really honorable job defending cops in person, but also I think you've probably defended a lot across the country right now Yeah, just by what you've shared on this. Yeah. And it's huge. And I think anybody that's listening that writes reports or involved in incidents really needs to dig into that yeah. and be very diligent yeah. because you've displayed a lot of stuff that, that can really come back at a later time. Totally. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, yeah, and, and I'd say, you know, for, for the audience members who are outside the jurisdiction of the ninth circuit, you know, go to your circuit courts website or you could just go. So if I'm in, if I'm in Texas, that's the fifth circuit. So we'll go on Google fifth circuit, civil model jury instruction, use of force. You'll get the link to the court website with the jury instructions. Click on it. It's a PDF. You go in the PDF, search use of force, takes you right to it. So whatever number jury instruction that is, and then read it. Yeah. I think everyone needs to do that. And you have a lot of info and we really want to talk about the 835A, which yeah. is out of California, which is the use of force. But I think what we should do is actually save that for another episode where we can bring you back yeah. and spend some really good time on that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's huge. Like yes. that's, that's a broad topic. We've, we've discussed it yeah. um, with some other guests, but um, I think you bring a unique style to your, uh, yeah. to your teaching, yeah. you know? Yeah. So Hey, listen, dude, thank you so much for carving out this time. Oh, I, course, I know yeah. you're probably tired. You've been teaching all day and it's all good. Um, yeah. yeah, obviously you're, you're very good at what you do. Like I said, I mean, a lot of people talk very highly of you. So we're honored that you were able to, to come on our podcast and share that information with the, uh, with the audience. Cause that was, that was solid. <laughs> well, I really appreciate the, the chance to come here and talk with you guys about it. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're talking earlier about how, you know, like the importance of podcasting, right? Mm -hmm. The, the amount of information that's, that's out there. And I think one of the things that we have to look at as a, if, if we just consider the law enforcement community, broadly speaking, there needs to be discussion yeah. about what's going on. Cause look, time, times are a changing and, and at least in California, the change is already upon us. Yeah. And you know, the statutes continue to be it's not just a matter of 835A being amended. Um, it's also has to do with, you know, something like AB 490, right? The idea of, of positional asphyxia being instantiated in, in the statute as something, right? And, you know, the state in California is willing to restrict its traditional police powers. As agents of, of that abstract thing we call the state, you know, you're a sworn officer. So you're, you're an agent of the government empowered to wield that authority. Yeah. You can't exceed the authority that you've, that you've been granted, right? If you do, you've committed a crime. And so as the state restricts its authority and establishes basically a stricter boundary on the exercise of traditional police power, you got to know where that boundary line is. And if you don't know where that boundary line is, then you are only accidentally not breaking the law. Yeah, the good point. And that and that's yeah. not that is not a place where I want police officers to live. I don't I don't want I don't yeah. want that. And it's and there's nothing that and look, I I do the civil side. I I talk with the practitioners who defend officers on the criminal side and and we kind of both say the same thing. It's like we're only attorneys. Whatever whatever happens we don't get to dictate the facts. This is like, this is what the case is going to be about. Mm -hmm. And we can't, we're not miracle workers. Right. You know, there's certain things we just can't do. And so. Well, you've, you've been a miracle worker right now for us. Oh, it's good. <laughs> yeah. And all the people yeah. that are listening. Yeah. It is awesome. So I think it's a matter of, yeah, like prevention and, and you prevent the disaster situation of like a, a bad lawsuit or something like that. You prevent that by being prepared. Yeah. And to prepare yourself you gotta like that's what we talked about you gotta know you gotta know the rules of the game and the rules of the game are in case law and and for california it's your statute 
uh, statutory authority under 835A, which, yeah, I'd love to come back and, and yeah. talk with you oh, guys yeah. about We will have to come back. Yeah. We, we really appreciate you being here. It's been super valuable. Great. Thanks yeah, for having me. Thanks for your time, Phil. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, for everyone uh, watching or listening, please go check out our website, shotsfiredpodcast.org. Um, and we will see you guys on the next one. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed that. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Shot fired. Copy additional shot fired. Shot fired. Shot fired. Shooting at us. Shooting at officer.